الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أي الأحباب A question was presented Some brothers do ghiba and namima meaning backbiting and slandering of other brothers, including those who have the same aqidah and menhaj, the same creed and the same methodology and understanding or the methodology in da'wah. And they say that they're doing jarh wa ta'deel. They say that they are practicing the science of jarh wa ta'deel where you criticize, this is a science, where the it dealt with the ruwat, the people who carried the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in order to authenticate the ahadith and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the science that deals with the chain of narrators and the various individuals, whether they were uh, authorities of hadith, they were trustworthy, they were in the other criterion for making judgments about these individuals. And basically the science is uh, a science in hadith revolved around the subject of dealing with narrators. And it also has a very strong relationship and the ulama speak about this, especially in this time and age, we have many of the scholars, some of our scholars from Ahl Sunnah who say that criticizing individuals is, is also a part of Jarwa Ta'adil. And some of our scholars say, no, this science basically ended with the narrators of Hadith. And both of them are from our scholars. They're both from the scholars of Ahl Sunnah. And this is a difference, uh, al -miya, which we, as beginning students of knowledge, don't really need to concern ourselves with and the lay persons. So, Back to the question, the brother said, some brothers do ghiba and namima of other brothers, including those who have the same aqidah and menhaj, and they say that they're doing jarwa ta'adil, that they're practicing the science. Or they say that they're doing halal ghiba, they're doing the lawful ghiba, you know, they're backbiting someone lawfully, which, as Imam Noah points out, that there is a time and place, and of course it comes from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when it comes to speak about individuals and to mention those specific individuals when they're causing a harm to the religion by innovating and deviating and spreading that harm and evil and sinfulness, that there may come times when it is applicable for us to criticize those individuals even outwardly. Perhaps it may come to uh, warning the people during a lecture or wherever the ulama or the students of knowledge or the mashayikh or the du'at have the need to do so. But this is a part of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is a part of preserving the religion. So the brother said, they find a couple of mistakes in a brother or may even be a student of knowledge, so perhaps even a student of knowledge, they criticize and find some mistakes with, and start headlining those mistakes and make tabdi on him, which makes the viewer, the reader, the listener, start hating the brother and boycotting him. They use evil methods when they're doing their jarwa ta'adil, such as misinterpreting what the brother really meant, quoting his statements out of context, sometimes they even lie against him, what should one do concerning them? So this is a very important question, but it's a question that the ulama have dealt with, and especially I would say in the past 10 years, there's been numerous treaties from the scholars of Ahl Sunnah dealing with these issues extensively. And with that, alhamd, that there are those brothers who stood up and Allah has favored them to translate that material into the English language. Some of the books that are very beneficial that deal with this subject, specifically on how we should deal with one another, that you'll find three things, three books I can recommend right off the get-go that are meant, that are translated into English. One is Alama, uh, Alama uh, Sheikhana, Sheikh Abdul Masin al-Abad, his treaties, uh, 
rifqin ahl sunna bil ahl sunna ahl sunna be gentle with one another this book deals extensively with this and it's in english so read it number two Shaykhana, as well, Shaykh Ibrahim al-Rahayli, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, and both of these scholars, just to mention, I've studied with both of them, so I call them my shaykhs, not just from reading their books, but alhamdulillah, sitting under their beards and benefiting from their, uh, the great benefit and the principles and the kawaii of Ahl Sunnah that they transmitted to us, that they related to us, and that they taught us with, and they practiced, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them, and forgive us and them of any shortcomings that we have. So this is the second treaty. It's also a treaty, treaty that deals with uh, how Ahl Sunnah should deal with one another. Uh, it's called Advice to the Youth of Ahl Sunnah. It's also a very a tremendously beneficial treaty. You will find immense benefit on how we should deal with one another. It answers this. So. This actually requires extensive uh, answer, but I'm going to be very short and brief, as, as brief as I can, to just give you and point you in the direction where you can get further and uh, further information that will be very beneficial and imperative for you to read if you're serious about learning the answer and on how we should deal with one another and deal with our brothers and sisters who involve themselves uh, in criticizing others without the right to do so. This is without the right to do so I'm talking about. I'm not talking about those who have a hawk in criticizing and warning the community against uh, people who have deviated in the religion who are, and who are spreading their deviation, taming the youth and destroying the creed and the menhaj or the methodology of the youth of Ahl Sunnah, of the youth of the Muslimin in general. So, and the third uh, treaties, which is not entirely translated. It's only just a, a very, actually it's not a part of his treaties, it's not translated, but he did something else, and it's also Sheikh uh, Muhammad Ali Mam, one of our mashayikh in Yemen, Allah Yohafadahu, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him and raise him up, and the Sheikh also has written especially more recently in the past few years extensively about this topic and as they deal with this fitna quite a bit in Yemen as well uh, and so though that's also something you'll find uh, translated into English and it is entitled the fitna of Jarwa Ta'deel or something like this the fitna uh, of this science of Jarwa Ta'deel in this day and age or the science of criticizing individuals and praising individuals or what have you. And so it's also very brief and the Sheikh breaks it down very precisely and concisely about the problem and giving us a solution. So now briefly I will uh, try to summarize what I have learned with regards to this and, and it had some limited experience and have read those three treatises and others that first, Ayyul Ahbab, that you have to realize there will be ikhtilaf. There's going to, going to be khilaf and ikhtilaf. There's going to be differences of opinions, differences of views, and of course they're not always correct. They're not always correct, the various views. Obviously, if you have two differences, then more than likely, it depends on the type of ikhtilaf, and we're going to talk about this very briefly, is that those things uh, are opposites. If so-and-so has a view, and this person has a view, and per, there's a high, high chance that because they have differing views, that they're both not, uh, they both were not correct in their view. And Ayul Ahbab, we'll, can, we'll call that, that's one type of ikhtilaf. So we're gonna talk about basically two basic categories of, uh, of differing. And some of the ulama, they mention these ikhtilaf, these two types of ikhtilaf, is ikhtilaf al tadad wa ikhtilaf al tanawar. Ikhtilaf al tadad is the ikhtilaf I was just speaking about. When you have a difference about an issue or a mas'ala, and 
your differences and your views are total opposites. There's no way to reconcile them. They contradict one another. So in this situation, obviously, both cannot be correct. They both cannot be correct if they're total opposites. Two opposites of truth is not both uh, uh, right and wrong. I mean, it's the truth. The truth in and of itself stands strong. So, and, and the Prophet ﷺ said in this regard, with regards to seeing many differences, قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَمَنْ يَعِيشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِ فَسَيَّرَى اِخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever lives, whoever lives after me, they will see many differences of opinion. In one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, he said that you will see, uh, those who live after me will see many differences. And then he gave us a prescription. It's upon you my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided uh, uh, khalifid, meaning Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, radiyallahu ta'ala anhum uh, ajma'een and, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with all the sahaba to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een so, Ayyul Ahbab, the Prophet ﷺ prophesied that there would be great differences. And that there would be groups and sects and people calling to different da'wahs and, and so forth. Which I think is not a mystery to any of us if we read the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The issue arises then, what should we do? The Prophet ﷺ said, Friday can be sunnati. Go back to the sunnah. But what if we don't find a clear answer or it's unclear to us what the sunnah is in this regard? And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلَ أَهْلِي ذِكْرٍ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. Do your best not to engage in a lot of uh, excessive discussion, but go to the ulama, go to the scholars. If you don't have access to the scholars, go to the students of knowledge in your locality from Ahlul Sunnah that can give you the toji hat, can give you the direction and help you with regards to these situations. And what becomes problematic, I'll try my best not to make it a huge lecture, but to stick with the question as concisely as I can. As we mentioned, the ikhtilaf, it's uh, tawad, which we just mentioned, where it contradicts uh, two opposing views that contradict one another. And ikhtilaf tanoa. The ikhtilaf tanoa is when you have different grades of differences. And this, ayul ahbab, when we have these different grades, that means, for example, I'm just showing you some illustrations to make it overly clear, even with my hands, that look, all, all my fingers are pointing in the right direction. They're pointing in the same direction. Okay? But they're different. This one's going slightly this way, this one, this one, this one, and this one's going this way, but they're generally going straight or in the same direction. This, Ayyul Ahbab, could be a likeness of ikhtilaf to Noah, meaning that the difference is in a difference in grade, but not really, they don't contradict one another. So perhaps there's room, meaning there's room for some slight differences, like in many issues in fiqh, many issues, I didn't say all issues, but many issues in fiqh, that you shouldn't make uh, a, a, a uh, be harsh with your brothers and sisters if they hold a, a, an opposing view. You should try to gain the knowledge if you, especially if you are uh, want to be a seeker of knowledge, seek the knowledge and try to understand where they're coming from. Where's their evidence? This is what the Talib al-Ilm does. The Talib al-Ilm, they are the one, they go into those books, they go into those messiah, as, as the ulama do. And then they have an understanding of those different views. So you see that when they deal with these issues, they don't say, oh, why are you moving your finger? Why isn't your finger moving like this? Why, uh, uh, you, uh, you, when you came up from Ruku, you didn't put your hands back on your chest. Instead, you came up and you did like this. Well, those differences, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, most of those differences fit under ikhtilaf at-tanawwa, the various 
uh, great gradations of ikhtilaf, meaning that there's room in the nasus, there's room in the text of the Quran and the Sunnah for those differences and for the different interpretations so that we don't say necessarily that everyone is correct, but we say that from what we have, that uh, perhaps perhaps there are some issues where the Prophet wasallam did two different uh, ways of, like for, for example in Tishahum, or, or many other Messiah where the, the affair is, uh, it's, a, it's a more open, uh, more room for openness in Ijtihad and interpretation. Because the Prophet ﷺ may have did it, did a particular action in more than one way. So then that gives us room. So then that means if you want the Sunnah, then perhaps maybe you will alternate with how you do certain issues and you will, you will gain the sunnah that way because there's authentic hadith that mention it this way and authentic hadith that mention it that way. That's a little bit about ikhtilaf. Another thing I want to mention about ikhtilaf, because this is a very important question, uh, question, and it also, as I said, I mentioned those treaties which you need to go back to in order to deal with this. Uh, khilaf, as one of the bahithin, regarding uh, and fiqh, a very fantastic treatise, he, all, about, uh, all about khilaf. And he mentions, so very briefly, I'll, he mentions the anwa khilaf, the different, uh, different types of khilaf. He said the first is, uh, the, there's two types. Basically, he's breaking it down as we mentioned. But he's using a, a little different istilah, or uh, mustalahat. He's saying, that there's khilaf madhmum. There's the uh, sinful or the impermissible khilaf differences. Impermissible khilaf. And then the second type is khilaf sa'id. And this is the khilaf where it's something where maybe it's an issue, uh, a mas'ala or an issue where there's room for ijtihad. He breaks down the khilaf al madhmum, the, the dislike khilaf. He mentions several different. Um, Examples. He mentions khilaf al kuffar. He mentions the difference. This is the uh, so these are differences that cannot be reconciled. For one, differences between the people of iman and the people of disbelief. Uh, one particular example. It's permissible to for uh, a lot of other faiths to drink alcohol. Okay, but in Islam. That's impermissible. So this difference cannot be reconciled. It cannot be reconciled. A Muslim is not permissible for a Muslim to buy it, to sell it, to promote it, etc. That is, we cannot reconcile that difference. That's a part of ikhtilaf al-qadad or ikhtilaf madhmum as the Shaykh mentioned. Another example he gives is a difference between ahl ahwa wa ahl bid'a. That also we cannot reconcile reconcile between differences, for example, we have those groups who say it's permissible to go make tawaf around the graves uh, and to supplicate to the Prophet wasallam, supplicate to, the, to their sheikhs, even after they've deceased, whether living or, or dead. We cannot reconcile that as Muslims and as uh, Ahl Sunnah. Ahl Sunnah cannot uh, tolerate this difference. This difference right here is uh, it, impermissible, and there's no compromise in that thing. These differences are completely in opposition to one another. Another example he mentioned: خلاف واقع في مسائل التي لا مصرح للاجتهاد فيها. So he also mentioned that uh, the differences, uh, real difference, in issues where there is no room for ijtihad, meaning that there is a sahih sound. Text, nusus, there are nusus that are sound, meaning text from the Quran or the Sunnah, ayats or ahadith or athar of the salaf or the salaf had ijma on this issue or something. So that mean, means we have strong dalil. You can't debate that. You can't debate the Quran. You can't debate the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and say, well, my shaykh has ijtihad in this issue and it goes totally against the Quran, it goes totally against the Sunnah. No. That also is, is irreconcilable. Uh, you know, there's no way to reconcile those differences. And uh, it is uh, impermissible. 
So that, uh, and the last uh, example he gave is different in issues where there is some room for ijtihad, but the person who adheres to a particular view within that, he's only holding on to it as in a way in being oppressive or out of blind following, you know, his madhab and, and his, his imam or what have you, even though it may go against the evidences or so forth, or the stronger evidences, or he's adhering to that because it conforms to his desires. So that's also from the ikhtilaf madhmoon. Khilaf sa'ik is the other type, and that is where, for example, it's similar to the last example, where it's an issue of ijtihad, or a mas'ala where you don't have a text from the Qur'an or the Sunnah for, and there's room for ijtihad, and, but the difference is that the, the people are not adhering to those views based on blind following and uh, re going against the text, you know, saying, oh, my sheikh said this, that's it, it's the truth. Or, you know, my madhab says this, even if the hadith says that. No. This type right here is the one that's permissible where the person is doing this because they believe it's the most correct and there's room for ijtihad. There's no nusus and there's room for difference there and they are going with the evidence that they believe they believe is the strongest. Not based upon their desires, not based on ta'asim, not based on uh, hoa, their desires. Now, going back more specifically to the question, so what do we do? This is when we're talking about differences between Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Bidah, or Ahlul Sunnah and even Ahlul Sunnah, those different, uh, especially Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Sunnah in the last issue we men mentioned, Khilaf al -Sa'id. So what do we do when we have our brothers and sisters involving in this affair of criticizing individuals? Number one, this is very dangerous because as Sheikh Salah bin Fuzan, and way before Sheikh Salah bin Fuzan, Imams like Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, Sheikh Islam, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, wa kathir minhum, hatta min salafina, that we find that they dealt with this issue, that this is not for everyone to engage in, number one. So the sisters that don't know how to read Fatiha properly, the brothers who don't know how to read Fatiha properly, or even if they do, even if they have something uh, something small of, of knowledge. This is, the, we're talking about the lay people. What about even the students of knowledge? Even the students of knowledge, if they don't have strength in these issues, they should not engage themselves in this. So if, if this is the case for the beginning of students of knowledge, as Sheikh Salim bin Fozan says, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, and, and I've mentioned this quote in earlier videos before, that, and you can find it on his website, that he mentions about this, uh, that this is not this is not even for the beginning student of knowledge. They shouldn't even involve themselves in making tafsir and tafsik with tafsir. Okay, so they shouldn't even involve themselves in this. Number one, number two. Okay, many people do. The fact is, there's many people who can't read Fatiha properly, and but they involve themselves with such with an amazing science, a, a, a very uh, a science that's in fact complex. Um, a science that involves ilm al fiqh and it involves uh, strength in the Arabic language. So there are many people who don't even know Arabic and they're engaged in the science. And Arabic is just a minor condition for that. You can't, how are you going to get deeply involved in these issues and you don't even know the language that the science was transmitted in and you don't even know uh, the mustalahat and, and so forth. These are, these are complex issues. It's not for us. The, the lay person to get involved in this. Uh, so the fact that they do, how do we deal with that? For one, if they're the general people and they're ignorant, avoid them. And you're going to have to stand strong and begin to know that sometimes you're just going to be by yourself. You're going to, uh, and, and mashallah, Ahl Sunnah Mujud, there's many people from Ahl Sunnah. Uh, around the world, so I'm sure someone in your locality, there'll be good people who just want the haq, they just want to seek knowledge, they just want to better themselves, they just want to serve themselves from the hellfire, so you will find those kind of companions. Other people, even if they make to day of you, it really doesn't affect you. It may hurt you a bit, but in fact, 
you will see over the long term, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will aid you. Because you are choosing to benefit yourself. And this is what many of the mashayikh are, are teaching, and you'll find it in those books that we mentioned, that they're teaching and, and, and letting the, know, the people know, hey, get away from that. And they're talking to students of knowledge. So what about the layperson? If those people don't want to listen, avoid them. Avoid them. Because more than likely, the fact that you differ with them, not even it's a matter of truth or falsehood, just because you differ with them and what they say and what they view about an individual or what they think, they're going to make tip D, they're going to call you an innovator, they're going to maybe slander you, maybe they're going to, they're definitely going to backbite you, and they're going to avoid you anyway. They're going to make hijra, uh, uh, hijra of you anyway. So you can't please all the people. This is just the reality. And it's a sad reality because a lot of times, as mentioned, the questioner mentioned, may Allah preserve them, that this is issues between people who have the same aqidah and the same minhaj. Sheikh Aid Shemri Havdallah Ta'ala was, uh, was asked this question when there was uh, a lot of controversy between some of the ulama in Yemen and some of the Marrakis of Sunnah there. The Sheikh was asked about that and he gave very beautiful advice and I have quoted this many times and it's fantastic advice. And he said that if they can't get along, because, you know, for one, they don't have cause to be fighting, because he's from Ahl Sunnah, and he's from Ahl Sunnah, and it's only hurting the Dawah, so to speak. I'm paraphrasing. But if they can't get along, then this one calls the Sunnah in his locality. This one calls the Sunnah in his locality. Don't let that destroy the Dawah. So you're going to have to, we have to come to terms with the fact that some, some of our brothers and sisters will never agree with us because everyone has different reasons. Some, maybe they're legitimate and they do believe that so-and-so or they believe you're an innovator or what have you. Maybe they believe that in their heart and they're actually trying to please the law by avoiding you in this. This is perhaps the case. But we also know that what is the case for many individuals is it's about their desires. It's about supporting their clique. It's about uh, sometimes raising themselves up because if they make this die go down, then they look good and they will get more followers. This is also something they're going to be called to count before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because your fame in this world is temporary. You're the fame that you were the, 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 the great Salafi Merkas in such and such locality or that you were this or that you were someone who was top warrior, all that's going to go, especially if it's not substantial. Especially if you didn't leave behind three that the Prophet ﷺ said, If a person dies, he will leave behind, uh, all his deeds will end except three. That uh, Sadaqajari, the continuous charity, knowledge that, that it's benefited from, and a righteous child that supplicates for you while you're in your grave. So all the other fame and fortune, some people benefit financially from the Dawah. Wallah Musta'an. And all that's going to go. So they get a temporary reprieve right now. But in the hereafter, Wallah Musta'an. The third point I want to mention here. So you should do your best to avoid them. Because it's going to be difficult uh, to change the mindset of many of the people. Then if they're not listening to the ulama, they're surely not going to listen to us. Uh, and you should just continue on benefiting. But at the same time, be aware if someone is making a legitimate criticism of someone you may benefit from. You must, if you have the ability, look into the issue. For example, some ulama that I love dearly that are Ulama were well known for the Sunnah that some of the Ulama of Ahl Sunnah now are criticizing. So we see this difference, and some are defending. We see this ikhtilaf kathira. So what do we do? We go to the Ulama about that, and at the same time, we also, if you have the ability, if you are uh, at least a student of knowledge and you have the ability to go into the to books and to look into those principles and go back to those durus that you study, then you have the ability to make a bath, to look into that. The sheikh said this. Sheikh so-and-so is criticizing him for this. 
So you have the ability to look at those things, look at their evidence. It's because no one is above the evidence. So I hope that this is something that will be beneficial. And I hope, I, I know I spoke uh, at length, and hopefully may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve us and reward us. And that's why I've decided that we're going to make, uh, go through Sheikh Abdul Masin Al-Abad's book uh, in a series of the rules, Rifqin Ahl Sunnah Bi Ahl Sunnah, because we always need the reminder. And if one person benefits from it, well, alhamdulillah, then that one person will benefit from the fiqh of the Sheikh and the basira of the Sheikh and will be on fiqh and basira in practicing the religion and coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how they relate to their brothers and sisters of Ahl Sunnah, even if their brothers and sisters of Ahl Sunnah are going against them. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.